Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome everyone again to another episode of All Things Fitness. This is your host, Cross the Christian Cyclist. And today we have uh, a treat for you. We have something different. Uh, usually we're talking about athletic things, but everything that we talk about is always related to the kingdom of God and the work of the kingdom. And today we're going to talk about a different kind of work of the kingdom. Uh, we're going to talk about a nonprofit organization with a good friend of mine, Mike, and his friend, Ray. And we're going to talk about Water Wins. I won't spoil it for you. I'm going to let them tell you about it. But let's get Mike and Ray in the studio now. Hey, how you doing, guys? Good evening. Hi. Good to be with you. <laughs> um, so uh, to our audience who don't know, and we're going to get into it. We got 30 minutes to kind of tear this all down and put it together for people who are interested, people who don't know who you are or what you're about. Water Wins. When we say Water Wins, uh, tell me about the organization Water Wins. So Water Wins is an organization that is based in the EKA region of Nigeria, very remote part uh, in the northeast part of Nigeria, very poor, primitive part of the country. And uh, in 2005, um, a group uh, decided that they wanted to help this community. And so they started the, the most pressing need was water, clean, available water uh, that was not available. And so they started by um, uh, drilling wells, providing clean water, because there's high, high uh, infant mortality rates when you don't have clean water. And so this was one of the uh, the first areas of focus that um, Water Winds wanted to um, to focus on, but that's not where it ends, of course, because in order to build a thriving Christian community, uh, you need a lot of other things. So then they looked at healthcare, uh, providing healthcare for for kids and for families. They talked about education, providing education for both uh, children but also adult literacy. Uh, also looking at uh, church planting, looking at how do we bring the gospel to uh, these folks, because most of them are indigenous okay. and uh, have, not, have never heard of the gospel before. And then to, uh, part of the, the final part of a healthy ecosystem is uh, job creation and providing people livelihoods that they could actually work uh, for a living, provide for themselves. And so what that's really where the uh, the impetus was. But uh, going back to the water wells uh, and and where really Water Winds gets its name from is uh, it's not only a matter of just drilling a well and providing a um, a pump, but it's also maintenance, and that's a key uh, distinguishing feature of Water Winds is to make sure that those uh, pumps are being serviced. Because what is often the case is that uh, wells are drilled, a pump is put on. And a year later, you come back and nobody has learned how to service them or there isn't local ownership in that well. And so they also uh, partnered with a group from West Michigan, uh, a group of engineers, uh, an organization or company there that an engineering company. And they've really helped develop uh, some of this technology that they can actually remotely monitor the health and well-being of that well to make sure that it keeps pumping do do me a favor for those who really don't understand how important it is for clean water to be in a very indigenous area such as like in your case you you guys are in a, a western you say the east western side of Nigeria uh, mm -hmm. or the EKE region of Nigeria how important yes. I mean you know there's obviously when we're talking about third world countries right there's a lot of needs and there's a there's a lot of uh, concerns and there's a lot of outreach that's happening, but water itself, how important to, to really help the listening audience understand why you guys focus stand on water. Uh, can, is there a way to even summarize that to how important that is? Well, yeah. And I think it's hard for us to really to fathom that unless you've actually been there because, you know, we, we turn on a tap and there's clean, safe water. We never have to worry about, filtration or are we going to get sick? Uh, but the infant mortality rate of especially kids is is very high in these areas simply because they are drinking water from a contaminated river. 
uh, from every every source that they have is contaminated. You know, and so I, when, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Well, I'm just saying that when you drill a well, you're you're sourcing water from in the ground. It's it's uncontaminated, and then it, of course the local community really owns that well and is taking care of it and ensuring that the water continues to come and it's also safe and clean for the long term. What what I was going to say was um, probably the closest we've come to even understanding the necessity of clean water here in the, in our Western culture would be the incident that happened, I think, what, a year ago in Detroit, where the mm-hmm. water got contaminated. And for months in, they were shipping water. We had outreach organizations going down to supply clean water. I mean, that just in a in a culture like ours, in a civilization as modern as we are, um, to not have clean water can completely turn a society upside down. Uh, so imagine on a daily basis, this is the conditions they live with of having sure. contaminated water uh, and having, uh, you know, to drink. And I've I've been in Ghana. I've, I've worked with an organization uh in Ghana and Twifa Prasa in Ghana, we dealt with uh, uh, human sex trafficking, which was the outreach that our organization dealt with. Um, but one of the main things that the first thing that jumped out was water uh, and the lack of clean water. And even us going there, how hard it was to get clean water. Um, and so I think what your organization is doing is very important. Tell me a little bit of how you got started. How did you guys get started with this? With, uh, you mean, uh, as, as the organization on as, the ground? Uh, uh, I, well, let me ask you, this. are you the founders of the organization or you work for the organization? I, I work for the organization. Okay. So, so the, the organization uh, predates you? I, I'm imagining yes. they've been around for a while. Okay. So how yeah. did you, how did Mike, how did you guys get involved with this mission? You know, um, part of my cycling for, for 20, you know, when, when COVID hit, uh, a buddy of mine from church, we just decided to ride a couple of weeks into, into COVID. He's like, Hey, you want to hop on our bikes and go see if we can find a cup of coffee somewhere? We did. The next week we had four of us, you know, everything was shut down, uh, Sports, you know, parents weren't able to have their kids in sports. You know, within a month, we had 13 to 15 riders riding every Saturday and Sunday. You know, our church was shut down. Um, didn't know Ray. Met, met Ray, um, you know, a couple of months in. And we just started riding two, three times a week. And, you know, during this time, I had picked up a book called A Hole in the Gospel. Um, and it just started opening my eyes to, to, to poverty and water, you know, and God started just ruminating in my heart, like, gosh, you know, we got 13 to 15 guys right every weekend. I wonder if we could just maybe do a, a fundraising ride and, uh, didn't know what that looked like. Um, just so happened a couple of months in Ray and I were riding, it was just Ray and I, Everybody bowed out that day, and we were talking. I shared with them my journey, and you know the seed the, the seed God had planted. And uh, he's like, you know, um, just so happens that I work for partners, and and we, you know, we're involved with water winds. And um, one of the guys we ride with, Jeff Sharda, he's also involved with water winds, and you know. Obviously, the rest is history, right? We were like, well, let's just do this fundraising ride. Uh, we will ride for, for, for water winds. And, uh, you know, Ray, Ray and I's conversation was like, hey, if we could get 10 of us to ride, each raise $500, we can put one well in. In that first uh, that first year, we had over 20 riders, and we raised about $25,000. Oh, wow. So um, That's incredible. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Yeah, that's, it was amazing. We were we were blown away. Well, when you can't explain it, that's the best way to know that God did it, right? God's <laughs> hand is definitely on it. Yeah, yeah. I I, um, I I love that story. I, I, how about you, Ray? How did how did you get involved? 
So I um, actually, I've been working for partners. So I work for the organization Partners Worldwide uh, for seven years now. Okay. I, I worked in the business uh, world for 26 years and uh, didn't plan to get involved in the nonprofit world, but I was attending a conference that was looking at um, rural poverty and uh, the impact on the fact that 70% of the poor still live in rural communities. And that's one of the communities that Waterwinds is, is touching here. And um, I uh, ended up uh, meeting with uh, the CEO and founder and uh, three months later I was working for them. And uh, it, it was a God thing because it wasn't on my radar, but I just felt uh, a compelling urge to, um, to get involved because um, Partners Worldwide is, is a global organization that is uh, focused in 30 different countries. And it started 25 years ago in Kenya, oh. when really a group of, of business people from the US were meeting with a group of business people from Kenya. And they said, what can we do as business people to alleviate poverty? Um, God has gifted us with certain skills and abilities. Um, you know, we're entrepreneurial, we, we create jobs, we, we create um, local economies. And um, so we said, yes, this is the way that we can end poverty by creating these healthy communities. Um, and so we focus on the economic side of things, but we partner uh, with locally owned and led organizations like a Waterwinds. Waterwinds is not owned by Partners Worldwide. It's locally owned and led. It's owned and led by Nigerians. And we come alongside with our toolkit and we say, how can we help you? And then we bring people like Mike, uh, volunteers that kind of come alongside and, and put their shoulder to the wheel with us and say, what can we do here in St. Charles, Illinois to help um, lift people out of poverty and to move that infant mortality rate in this case from almost 50% to less than 10% when they have clean water. Wow. That's, <clears throat> that's a, that's a huge number. I mean, yeah. that's saving 40% of lives that would die from contaminated mm -hmm. water. So yeah. what, what would you say, what are some of your biggest challenges, if, if you could summarize it in a sense? Um, as far as from the, the, the ministry perspective, it's, um, I mean, obviously during COVID, um, yeah. you know, things, especially in the developing world, a lot of uh, these countries simply shut down. And, um, you know, here we had the luxury of when they shut down an economy, um, there was governments and other things to kind of help us all kind of fill the gap. But when you go into these very, very poor remote communities and you shut down an economy, um, people live day to day. They work today to eat tomorrow. Right. And when you all of a sudden say, OK, you can't uh, you can't go to the marketplace is closed. Uh, so we've had in some countries where literally um, people would uh, vacate the towns they lived in and went out and scavenged in the countryside or went back to their villages just so they could eat. Um, so that was um, that was uh, that was quite a, um, a challenge. And so what's the big challenge now is kind of restarting these economies and getting people um, back um, on track. And uh, in a lot of these countries, too, there's uh, there's unrest. And so you're always dealing with that factor. And that's also an issue in, in certain parts of Nigeria. Yeah. Although we just had uh, some folks there um, actually just travel up to the EKA area the first time since COVID. Um, okay. So that's been a that's been a blessing for um, a team of partners worldwide folks to go there and to kind of work with them, come alongside them and to really encourage them that they are not alone, that there's a whole world coming alongside them that's yeah. praying with them. And also, you know, like what Mike is doing, it's tremendous that Mike is doing this on his own time and um, time and energy to kind of uh, get these cyclists together, help organize this fundraiser so that we can, our goal is that uh, if we can drill another 10 more wells through this fundraising campaign, uh, uh, that's our goal. Amen, amen. Well, that's that's <clears throat> that's absolutely uh, wonderful. Um, you know, a lot of oh, I guess one of my questions I would have for you that to the listening audience, um, obviously, COVID changed the world that we live in, you mm -hmm. know, in a major way. Um, and no matter whether you're a believer or non-believer, uh, 
you have to admit that it was a power greater than our own that can change the entire world with one single event. And we know as believers that the hand of God, uh, only God can do what has happened uh, and relieve what we're now been relieved of in this COVID. How has COVID impacted your work in Nigeria? Do you find like, you know, I work with a couple of different organizations and funding is different now. Uh, And is that a, do you find that to be challenging? Are you guys have a way you're working around or you're dealing with the economy issues that the world is dealing with to help this work to keep moving forward in Nigeria? Yeah, I think so. Uh, probably one of the, the biggest challenges is, is that it's kind of reset um, yeah. those that are living in extreme poverty. And when we talk about that, we're talking about people that live on less than $2 per day. So mm-hmm. what we call the very bottom of the economic pyramid, that's really our our focus area. And so it's really, it's um, it's a it's a reset for the, the local economy. And it's... Um, the, the challenge is, is just to to get people restarted, um, you know, as far as reconnecting to, to jobs, reconnecting to livelihoods and uh, actually even the well drilling, you know, that that took a, a bit of a um, uh, time off just because they they literally couldn't get their the, the grill and or the drilling um, rig to the various communities to uh, to drill wells. And you, you had mentioned earlier about uh, your organization is also uh, helping employ within yeah. the communities. Talk a little bit about that. How 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 do you how are you accomplishing? Let me say one of the main things that I seen when I was working in Ghana was creating an independence for self sufficiency. Right, helping those communities become self sufficient in a way. Uh, a lot of times, organizations come in and. They help, but not necessarily help them learn how to be self-sufficient. And yeah. me hearing you say that you help create jobs, that that's a great thing, because I think that should be a focus of any and almost all organizations that go into these communities is to help independence. Um, how are you guys accomplishing that? Well, you've probably heard of the uh, I think everyone has heard of this, you know, uh, you know, you give a man a fish and you feed him a day, teach a man how to fish and you feed him a lifetime. But we always say there's there's one more missing piece and that's called the access. Okay. And uh, mm-hmm. you got to give him access to the pond. That's and right. so that's really what we at Partners Worldwide are doing is that we are going into these communities. We're identifying entrepreneurs. Okay. Because God has an inherently gifted each of us with certain gifts and abilities. The image of God is in everyone. That's right. And so what we do is we identify those entrepreneurs. We've, uh, we've developed a, a micro uh, training curriculum to take them through a basic business training and a discipleship program. And then and we provide access to capital, so micro lending. Okay. And then we provide them access to mentors and to uh, uh, people like like a Mike that are willing to come alongside and say, "I'm I'm walking alongside you this this uh, this journey." So, one of the things that, and if you look at a, any kind of business community in here in the U.S., you go through a small town and you walk down Main Street, and all those shops are locally owned and led business people. And it's a, what we're trying to do is basically recreate Main Street in these villages and communities and say. There's entrepreneurs there, but they don't have access to markets or capital or training or knowledge. And so we're providing the access so that they can thrive and use their God-given gifts to do what God has called them to do, to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you yeah. find the from the political side, uh, do you guys have much or should I say, do you run into many roadblocks from a political standpoint of dealing with? I mean, it's one thing on the ground. There's another thing of the politics that's behind uh, when we try to get things like this done. I know from my experience, that was something that came to a shock for me uh, working with the organization is the political scene of trying to get work done that need to get done. But obstacles sometimes get in the way. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, it's very different from country to country. Like, for example, if you're looking at India, so okay. India is a Christian minority country, and so the the hurdles are much greater yeah. as far as um, 
you know, the opportunity to, to grow Christian business leaders. Okay. But at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity because people know exactly what they're up against. Mm -hmm. If you go to a country like Kenya or even Nigeria, for that matter, where there's a Christian majority, then you're dealing with, um, you know, issues like corruption. You know, and corruption is very, very rampant, and it usually starts at the highest level of government. One of the fortunate things for us as a ministry is that we are dealing with the, the very poor, the most vulnerable and poor, the bottom of the pyramid uh, of the economic pyramid, and typically governments don't want to deal with them. So they kind of let us do our thing because we're actually helping them. Okay. And uh, so we don't get a lot of interference as far as the work we do. Okay. And in some countries like um, like India, they're actually pro business. They want they they have a lot of poor people, hundreds of millions of poor people living in India. And so they are looking at organizations like Partners Worldwide and saying, hey, um, we like organizations that are kind of helping the poor that are helping us address these issues. That's fantastic. And, and you know, there's always uh, people who wonder, like, how much of it goes to the people, how much of it is being mess with through corruption and it's good that you can answer those questions because um we live in a world where we wish the the what god had laid upon our heart can be just expressed in a way that is uh how, how would i say it? equitable or in a way that uh we can get the work done in what we feel you know uh, but the organization that you guys have, it seemed like a vast and large organization and you're covering all the bases. Um, and what Mike is doing as a volunteer and others, I'm sure just like Mike in other communities have found a way to creatively uh, generate revenue and source of funding to help the work that's going on in these, uh, these indigenous areas of now, is it just Nigeria or is it just this is the mission, Mike, that you signed on to? Or is it other areas other than just Nigeria? Well, this is uh, just Nigeria for what we signed on for. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But we, partners, we like the organization, the, the I should say the parent organization of partners is in multiple regions, I'm sure. We're in, including Ghana. We're in um Asia, Southeast Asia, okay. um, Africa, and Latin America. So, yeah, we're, we're global in in impact. Okay. Um, what would you say? Let, let what would you say to the person who heart strings is pulled, if you will, on an outreach ministry like this? What would you say to that person? Well, I would say this, and Mike can follow, but um, I always say um, you have to have a heart for the poor, but you also have to have a mind for the poor. And I think mm -hmm. for us as North American Christians, um, we always feel that tug that, and that's good. We we should have compassion. That's right. that's what God has called us to have compassion. But I think you have to go a step further and say, yes. okay, is compassion just right in a check? In a lot of cases, no, it isn't. It's actually hurting more than it's helping. But if you also have the mind for the poor and you work with, like we do, with locally led and owned organizations that are uh, that are embedded in those communities, they know how to deal with the poverty issues. And you partner with them and you say, what kind of tools can we come alongside you? And then you can also then have the mind for the poor and say, how can we help them in a sustainable way? Give them a job, help start a business mm -hmm. so that, I mean, nobody wants nobody wants a handout. Everyone wants to, if so, somebody everyone wants to say, you know, Mike, he's he works with his hands. He's a gifted carpenter. Uh, do you think he would rather sit on a couch and and collect a check and not work and use his gift? <laughs> and, and that's the people that we're working with too. Is right. we're hard work and image bearers of God, and they want to provide for their family with dignity. And so that's what we try to do. I, I, I think sometimes our commercials or our marketing kind of misrepresent uh, if you've never been to a country where you see the pride that these people have. Uh, I think it's kind of misrepresentative in a lot of ways. Yes, they do need our help. Yes, they uh, in an extreme way. I, I, I say it all the time, you know, with our ministry is our homeless has more opportunity than they have a hundred times more because they have access, whether 
uh, they choose to use it. There's resources. We have uh, shelters. We have uh, places that, you know, uh, uh, food pantries. None of these things are available in these areas. Um, so, but when you go, you see such a, more, a, a remarkable character in these people uh, that is unbelievable. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, the first time I went to Africa, I was blown away. And it wasn't, I was blown away because it became real. That's first. Everything that I seen, it, it became very real. But more than that, I was blown away because of how much joy, joy. they yeah. had, how much peace they had in having nothing. And we have so much and we find reasons to be dissatisfied or we find reasons to to, you know, to have uh, to lack the peace of God or the joy of God. And, and you look at, you know, we had a church service. I'll never forget this. We had a church service. And at the time I was uh, I went there with another organization to minister and the pastor of the church we were at they did their offering call and i've never seen people dance down the offering line okay. oh, <laughs> and i'm that. thinking to myself they don't have a penny to give and they're dancing down this offering line and, and you know but it really put everything in perspective for you you know um it was a beautiful experience and i encourage anyone if they have the opportunity to go to whether it be africa india east asia any of these places where there's uh, poverty, I mean, really the poor, when we say poor, you know, on another level of poor. I just came back from Indonesia for a month, and the the place I loved the most was the mountains. Uh, <clears throat> and that was because that's where the poorest of the uh, Indonesian people lived. But it was the most peaceful. I rode my bike through the mountains. My wife... My wife got mad at me because I was in the mountains so much. She, she was like, we came for vacation. Every time I turn around, you're on your bike riding through the mountains. But I couldn't explain to her the peace that and the serenity and, and the way the people made me feel. I, I just couldn't explain it. Um, so that's a beautiful thing. I, I love what you guys are doing. Uh, I, I pray that that this message gets out and that the fundraising efforts and everything else that you're doing reach its intended target. You have a video, and I want to show this video. Uh, and I, a matter of fact, what we'll do is we'll close on the video. But before we get ready to close out, is there anything or a message that you – in fact, let's go to your website. Let's talk about uh, if you can give people the instructions on where to give. Let's pull this up real fast. Okay, so here's your website. Go ahead and explain to them what they need to do and how to do it. So uh, we, we've set up a, a fundraising page um, and uh, for, for the event, uh, the Century Ride that Mike uh, has organized. And uh, they can go to that website and they can learn about everything from uh, uh, joining the, the Century Ride. Um, that's going to happen on September 23. Uh, here at Mike's place in St. Charles, okay. and uh, our goal is to raise uh, fifty thousand dollars, or enough to drill ten wells in uh, in Nigeria, and uh, that we will then also, um, uh, you're, you know, we're also looking for riders. And so, if someone wants to ride, um, Mike, we we would love to have them. You know, what's what's amazing is the the passion that's been built up with, with other people, right? This is just a little seed that God planted in my heart. I shared it with Ray, right? <laughs> All of a sudden it starts happening. And, you know, again, that first year we had 21 riders. We raised $25,000. We had about 40 people involved. Year two, we had 29 riders. We raised just under $40,000. Wow. We had over 50 people involved. And this year, again, we're, we're, we've set it at 40 riders and $50,000. You know, it's, it's raising the awareness. You know, we're, we're expanding that awareness to people, right? People, you know, God pricks their hearts on, on water. That's what I'm finding out in the last three years. And, uh, you know, what's, what's cool, last year I think we had roughly 150 donations. So, again, 30 riders, 150 
different givers. So you know what? It's just it's growing, right? We're expanding that horizon of uh, people that you know people. You know, the comments they make, right? This is a great cause, right? You know, I don't think about this, but you know, you've, you've pricked my heart to That's think right. about this. That's so, right. and, and, you know, when the riders, you know, we've, we've asked the riders as they're, as they're doing the century ride to think about this, right? To pray about what we're riding for. And, you know, like Ray said, you know, we just, you know, we would take a shower, we hop in and, you know, we want to drink of water. It's just right. <laughs> boom. Right. In this country, it's, you know, drink your eight eight glasses of eight ounces of water a day. You know, we don't even think about that. We really don't. Or no, we need we, the water running in the bathroom, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah, it's yeah. been a cool journey. It, it, it is something certainly to think about. Um, and it's certainly something to pray about. Um, so, gentlemen, I'm going to pray us out if I could. Uh, I truly that. appreciate you all having on that. And time went really fast. I mean, I... You know, you, you don't realize how fast time go, but this was a worthy topic and it, it was something that I think the people will be blessed by. And I'm going to pray that God will truly uh, deliver all the needs that you all have for this mission, this ministry, this outreach effort. So let us just pray if we could. Father, we just thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this ministry. We thank you for the work of these two gentlemen, Father. We ask that you would supply their every need, Father. You said what you join, let no man put asunder, Father. So you are making connections. You are bringing people together. Father, we ask that you would touch the hearts of uh, the people uh, that's in need, Lord. Allow this ministry to not just be a service for water, but a service for salvation, Father. Let it draw those who don't know you closer to you in these areas. Uh, let them be the beacon of light uh, that you have set them out to be. Lord, I would ask that you would bring them and give them the resources because mm -hmm. we know that you are the supplier of all needs. There's nothing that you can't do. There is no place that you can't touch. There is no place on this earth that you cannot reach. And so we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. 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 I'm going to I'm going to end with this video uh, that you all have your um, the journey for water. Um, is there any last things you want to say before we go to our video? You know, I, Cross, I'd say this, uh, the first year, the first two years of our fundraising ride, uh, we just went up and down the Fox River Trail along, along the Fox River. Um, this year, we've added a, a road sentry. So we're trying to draw in some, some of those road riders. Uh, so um, just like to pass that word out to, to come join us. You know, we've, we've got plenty of people who like to ride on the trails. Uh, but trail and road riders are they're a different animal. So <laughs> right? I know you're speaking to me now. I I, I, I get the subliminal message. <laughs> yeah. So for yeah. for my road cyclists, um, if if you heard that, uh, this is not just a trail ride. This is a road. They they've added a road section. Uh, that there are different cyclists that like the road versus trails. That is very <laughs> true. Um, so we encourage you all. Uh, if you hear this, if you see this, it's give the date again. September 23rd. September 23rd. That's yep. what, the third weekend in September? Yeah, rough. Yeah. Yep. The that third weekend in September. Okay. September 23rd, guys. Uh, if you are available, um, they would much appreciate each and every one of you all. Uh, that would come out and support this, this wonderful outreach, uh, this mission, this ministry. Uh, cycling for water wins. Uh, and that's, it's a worthy, worthy cause. You've heard it here. And tell a friend, tell someone else. Uh, and if you're not able to, then uh, let the Lord touch your heart and, and be a resource giver. Help them with resources so that they can keep doing the work. Uh, so we encourage you in one way or another to participate with uh, Ray and Mike and all the others. And I'm sure there's many more with a heart just like these two that's working with this organization to do good work. So we thank you all.
Uh, we love you with the love of Christ. Gentlemen, thank you all for being on our podcast. I, I pray that uh, we reach everybody that God intended this to reach and touch all the mm-hmm. hearts that the Lord intended to be touched and that uh, the work continue to move forward. I know how difficult it is in these day and ages to get work like this done. And it's no small thing. It takes a community to help another community. And so we thank you all for the work that you're doing, truly. And thank you, Cross. Greatly Amen. appreciate you having us. Thank Amen. you. Let's go to this video and we'll end with your video. Uh, I, I thought it was a very nice uh, introduction to what you all are doing. Let's pull this up. Myself keep walking on. Here's something up ahead. Water falling like a song. An everlasting stream. Your river carries me home. Let it flow. Good morning.